Welcome to the recorded version of Living at Home with Arthritis, part of the Family Caregiver Support Webinar Series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. All right, our speaker today is going to be Molly Carpenter. Author, speaker, trainer, and family caregiver, Molly Carpenter brings years of personal and professional senior care experience and training to families dealing with dementia care. In her current role, Molly works with a team responsible for ensuring that Home Instead Senior Care Network's 60,000 caregivers worldwide have the resources necessary to effectively provide quality care in the home and understand the importance of their work enhancing the lives of those that they serve. Molly holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Family Science with a Gerontology Specialization from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and a Master's degree in Education with a Gerontology Specialization from the University of Nebraska-Omaha. And with that, I would like to welcome our presenter today, Molly Carpenter. Thanks for being here, Molly. Thank you, Steve, so much for that warm welcome. And thank all of you out there today listening to our webinar. I'm always so excited each month when this webinar comes around because it's a special one. I know we all, I have lots of webinars I sit on. I'm sure a lot of you do. And this one's dedicated to that family caregiver and how can we better support our family caregivers out there in the world. And um, our goal each month with these is just to give you some of that additional insight about a topic. It's usually a topic that you're probably pretty familiar with already, but we just look at it from a different angle. And today, that angle, we're going to talk about arthritis. We know it affects seniors, but it can also affect lots of younger, I put that in quotes, people as well, you know, like our family caregivers. You know, our 60-year-olds and our 65-year-olds uh, could be experiencing some arthritis uh, symptoms already. And so today we're just going to discuss some ways that we can, again, support families that are caring for people with arthritis. And I just, as, as we get started, I want to thank you all for your time that you take to pause and really think about um, these additional ways that you can support those families that you work with every day. So on the next slide, let's start with what exactly is arthritis. And I know, again, a lot of you are very familiar with arthritis or know what it is, but sometimes it just, let's refresh ourselves and let's make sure we fully understand what it is. Because this is well, something I, I wasn't aware of, that arthritis is, uh, has more than 100 different diseases. 100 different types of arthritis. I, I knew there were quite a few, but I didn't quite know there was that many. And there are different diseases that cause pain, swelling, and limited movement in joints and other parts of the musculoskeletal system. And many forms of arthritis are chronic, meaning they last for a lifetime or they are ongoing. And the limitations caused by arthritis certainly affect a person's quality of life. I'm sure you've all uh, know somebody that has arthritis and you know how quality of life can greatly be affected by that pain from arthritis. But with, with that comes um, an effect on that family caregiver. It makes their job and their, their role a lot more challenging. And some of these forms of arthritis can actually be life-threatening, which is, we'll talk about a few of those. And unfortunately, there's just really no cure for arthritis. Again, being chronic, there's really no cure, but there are ways to manage symptoms, which we will talk about today. Um, arthritis is very common, actually. 50 million Americans have a doctor-diagnosed arthritis, and we're expecting that number to grow to 67 million by the year 2030. And of those currently diagnosed, more than 21 million have arthritis, and what they have, they have arthritis-related activity limitations. So of all those people, almost half of them are experiencing some sort of activity limitation, which goes back to their quality of life and, that, and that, preserving that quality of life. And this is another interesting statistic we found, is that arthritis costs the U.S. economy around $128 billion in lost wages and productivity annually. So this is a, a, a dollar cost, too. This is a huge, huge issue. So with this background, let's talk about the objectives for this webinar on the next slide. 
Today we're going to discuss several important things that are related to arthritis. So we're going to start with the symptoms and the warning signs. Some of these are going to be familiar to most of you, but others may surprise you. We'll, we'll see. Uh, then we're going to talk about how arthritis is diagnosed and the kinds of medical specialists who can help people suffering with arthritis. And we're also going to talk about some of the common treatments of arthritis. And then always, you know, if you've sat on my webinars before, you know that I always talk about ways of preventing whatever chronic condition we might be visiting or talking about today. And we have to really cover that topic today because the preventative measures, they're going to be very helpful and beneficial for our family caregivers to hear. And always, you know, we, we leave with tips that can, and resources that can really help our family caregivers. So we're going to cover tips today and coping and support for, our, for sufferers as well as for those family caregivers. Okay. On the next slide, let's talk about some of the common types of arthritis. And really, there's three very common types of arthritis, and we're going to focus primarily on these three for this webinar today. And those are, as you see on the slide, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and fibromyalgia. So let's start with osteoarthritis. It's a degenerative disease characterized by the breakdown of joint cartilage. I, what people often refer to this type of arthritis as the wear and tear arthritis. So think of it as, the you know, as we age and we've been so hard on our bodies and our joints, this is the result is osteoarthritis. It's the most common form of arthritis, and it affects nearly 21 million Americans, most over the age of 45. So definitely in our family caregiver ranges there. In normal joints, the cartilage is a firm and kind of a rubbery material that covers the end of each bone. And that cartilage provides a smooth gliding surface for joint motion, and it acts as a cushion between bones. So when osteoarthritis occurs, that cartilage has, has broke down or is breaking down, and it's not as, as firm as it was, and it's not providing that smooth surface anymore, and it's causing pain, and it's causing swelling, and it causes that problems that, with, that are associated with moving the joint. So again, I, I know we probably are all pretty familiar with that, but I always just like to talk it through one more time just to think of an easier, easier way to explain to family caregivers. I know when I'm in, you know, visiting with doctors or medical professionals, sometimes the definition of what things are kind of go over my head a little bit because they're so knowledgeable and so smart and they're just you know, talking pretty fast. So I always just like to kind of break down exactly what this is for all of you. So as you're talking with families, you can think of a simple way to explain it. So when they're, when they're asking you these questions. The other thing I've heard from families is that they get confused about what is the difference between osteoarthritis and arthritis in general. Because when you think about what osteoarthritis is, it sounds like arthritis in general. It's wear and tear. It's, it's what happens to our bodies as we age. Well, I, I usually explain arthritis as sort of the general term for the chronic conditions that cause that damage to the cartilage and joints. And I compare it to dementia, for example. That's a common general term that describes cognitive decline. And then there are several types of dementia, just like there are several types of arthritis. So I always just try to explain that arthritis is sort of the umbrella term, and osteoarthritis is the most common, and it's the most um, it's the one that's the wear and tear form of arthritis. So that, that's kind of how I explain it to families if they do ask you that question or get confused. Now, the second type of arthritis that we're going to cover today, another common one, is rheumatoid arthritis. And the abbreviation for that is RA, obviously. But again, I say that because our family caregivers, when we say RA, to all of us, that's, that's what we call rheumatoid arthritis. They just might not be familiar with the terminology. So I just point that out. Now, RA is a systematic disease that affects the entire body, and it's characterized by the implement, implementation of the membrane lining of the joint, which, again, causes that pain, causes stiffness, the warmth, redness, and swelling. 
Now, in the United States, nearly 2.1 million people have RA, and there are two and a half times as many women than men with RA. So you can see that rheumatoid arthritis is not as common, thank God, because it's a it's very, very tough one, which we'll learn more about in a minute, but it's not as common as osteoarthritis, and unfortunately, as gals, we are tend to have it more than the men. So, again, just some interesting facts to understand. So arthritis, osteoarthritis is that joint damage caused by the natural wear and tear, and rheumatoid arthritis is really when the body's own immune system is attacking the joints, leading to the swelling, the pain, and the eventual destruction of the cartilage at the joint. So unlike the wear and tear osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis affects the interior lining of the joints. So I thought that was an interesting um, note to point out is that osteoarthritis, the body's own immune system, is malfunctioning and attacking the joints, which is causing the swelling and the pain. Okay, so the third most common type of arthritis that we're going to talk about today is fibromyalgia. Now, this, again, affects mostly women, and it is an arthritis-related condition, and it's characterized by a widespread muscle pain. And there is a presence of tender joints or areas of the body that are particularly, I'm sorry, that are very sensitive to pressure. I cannot say that word today. All right, so we've got three common types, but I want to go in a little bit deeper with each type and talk about the symptoms and the warning slide signs. So we're going to talk about osteoarthritis on the next slide a little bit more in depth. Now, the thing about osteoarthritis is that the symptoms often develop slowly, and unfortunately, they worsen over time. The symptoms range from mild to severe, just depends on the per person, and usually the joints affected by osteoarthritis, um, they ache or they become painful or right first thing in the morning or after uh, an uh, usage. So if, the, if somebody's walking a bunch, they might feel it right after they're done walking. And then, like I said, first thing in the morning, that can sometimes be a, a pain point. Osteoarthritis can occur in any joints, but the most common areas are the hands and those weight-bearing joints like the knees and the hips, and sometimes even in the spine. Joints may also be stiff after periods of inactivity. So therefore, it's important for people to remain physically active despite any initial discomfort they might feel. So that's, we talk about this a lot on these webinars where seniors sometimes, they don't want to exercise because it hurts, but if they don't exercise, it hurts. And so it's just, this is another one of those, it's, we've talked about it before when we talk about falls. Seniors are scared to fall so they don't walk, but not walking can cause falls. The same thing is with arthritis. It may be painful initially, and it might be painful afterwards, but, but it's sort of like either way, there's going to be a little bit of pain involved. And we're going to talk about treatment in a few, in a few slides, so we'll, we'll cover that. But exercise really keeps those joints moving, and it helps them stay lubricated. So, it, and it, you know what, it also builds strength in the muscles surrounding affected surrounding the affected joint, so exercise helps us build those muscles, and the muscles can better support it. So again, there's benefits to exercise, and, and you, if you've been on one of my webinars before, you know that we talk a lot about exercise and nutrition and how important it is when we're trying to age well and, and healthy aging. Okay, on the next slide, let's talk about the symptoms and signs of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, it's a different form of arthritis, as we discussed a little earlier, and it's a long-lasting disease that can affect joints in any part of the body except the lower back, and it mostly involves the hands, the wrists, the knees, and the feet. And with RA, the immune system, which is our body's defense system against disease, it mistakenly attacks itself and causes the joint lining to swell, which is 
just even that whole thought is just very overwhelming to even think about the immune system attacking itself. But that's what happens in RA. And so that inflammation then spreads to the surrounding tissues, and it can eventually damage cartilage and the bone. Now, in more severe cases, rheumatoid arthritis can affect other areas of the body, such as skin, the eyes. I've actually seen cases, read stories about people who've gone blind from RA the lungs, the mouth, and nerves. And with RA, the person's joints may feel warm to the touch, and they might notice a decreased range of motion, as well as some inflammation, some swelling, and some pain in those areas of the affected joints. So the other thing about rheumatoid arthritis is that if a joint on one side of the body is affected, the corresponding joint on the other side of the body is also involved. And the other thing is that inflammation is systematic, and so the person with RA is likely to feel fatigued, and they may become anemic and lose their appetite, and sometimes can even run a low-grade fever. So you can see the differences between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. RA can be challenged for people, and it's it's a lot a lot more serious, and it's a lot harder, and it's it sounds a lot more painful. And and I know we know all know people that have RA, and that it's just it's a game, it's a it's a lifestyle change, it's a complete change in how they feel day to day. And so we have to think about those family caregivers. Think about the position there, and this is one of those very painful diseases, and it can really have an effect on that person's quality of life, which then affects our caregivers. You know, when our family caregivers are supporting somebody with, with our RA, it can be very, very emotional, very draining. It can be very hard to see a loved one in that much pain and that much chronic pain on a regular basis. So we just have to keep that in mind. Um, I know we're, we all practice such sympathy and empathy all the time, but, but when you really stop and think about RA, that it's a, definitely a special role for that family caregiver. Okay, let's look at the symptoms and warning signs for fibromyalgia on the next slide. Now, fibromyalgia affects about 6 million Americans, and it causes not only pain around the joints, but also tenderness in the muscles and the nerves. Sleep problems can also occur, and that can lead to another symptom of severe fatigue. Now, the widespread pain and that severe fatigue can disrupt the person with fibromyalgia, their ability to function at full capacity on a daily basis. So again, this is a huge impact on their quality of life, and it may increase that workload for the family caregiver. A possible cause for fibromyalgia is an altered function of the central nervous system. And the American College of Rheumatology's guidelines for diagnosing fibromyalgia require a person to have widespread pain throughout their body for at least three months. Now, widespread pain, it's defined as having pain on both sides of the body, as well as above and below the waist. Someone with fibromyalgia may experience signs and symptoms that are seemingly unrelated, such as maybe chronic stomach aches or headaches, but fibromyalgia can even mimic or overlap many other conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, MS, or even sleep apnea. So that's, again, another very challenging form of arthritis is the fibromyalgia. Now, there's a few other forms of arthritis that we hear about that are, but are kind of less common than these big three. And I, so I do want to just briefly touch on a couple of those. And one of those that I, for some reason, I've been hearing a lot about lately is gout. Gout is one of those forms of arthritis, and it occurs when uric acid accumulates in the blood and seeps out into the tissues, forming crystals that can cause acute pain. It can cause inflammation, and it can cause loss of appetite. And it usually affects one joint at a time and often in the big toe. So I'd, it's just interesting that that's another form of arthritis, and it's one that's starting to get a little bit of 
um, I've just seen it a little bit more in articles and in the news and in the media and a couple family members. So I just wanted to point that one out. And another one I wanted to point out is psoriatic arthritis, which is a form of arthritis that occurs in conjunction with the scaling skin disease, psoriasis. And arthritis usually develops after the skin disease, but in some people, the arthritis begins first. So that's another one we've heard a little bit about as well. And then lupus. That's one that, that I'm sure a lot of us have come across before and have, and have maybe helped some people that have had lupus in their families. And lupus is an autoimmune disease in which the immune system, again, turns against the parts of the body it is designed to protect, leading to inflammation and tissue damage. Now, lupus can affect many parts of the body, including the joints, the skin, kidneys, lungs, heart, blood vessels, and the brain. So lupus is a lot more serious. But I, I had to pause and think about the differences between lupus and RA because I think that families might come up with that question occasionally. You know, what are the differences since they're both autoimmune and they both turn against the immune system? But the differences is, well, first of all, the similarities are they are both autoimmune. They both have joint swelling that can cause hot and tender joints. But with lupus, we, I just mentioned, it can affect some of those internal organs, the kidneys, the lungs, the heart, the blood vessels, the brain. And it can affect the skin. And, it, and lupus can be life-threatening with complications. So that's, it's one of those very serious forms of arthritis. So that's maybe a little bit about the differences between RA and lupus. The other thing is, is that the pain with lupus is constant which is very, very hard, very, very sad, very hard. And rheumatoid arthritis is not fatal, and sometimes lupus can be fatal with those complications like I just mentioned. We also know that rheumatoid arthritis does cause some deformity in the joints occasionally, and lupus does not. So the, I just wanted to point out a couple of those differences as we talk today between those, those two types of arthritis, because they do are a little bit similar, have a couple things in common, I should say. Okay, so we're familiar with some of the symptoms and warning signs of the most common forms of arthritis. Let's take a look now about how arthritis is diagnosed and the kind of medical specialist that can help someone who's suffering from arthritis on the next slide. So it's important to remember that arthritis refers to more than 100 different diseases that cause pain, swelling, that limited movement in the joints, and other parts of the musculoskeletal system. The key to successful treatment is early diagnosis and the implementation of an appropriate treatment plan. So one of the key factors people should be aware in de is determining when they should seek medical treatment. And to start, is, is the swelling or stiffness in joints, does it last for more than two weeks? That's one of the big key factors that people should be aware of. And this is really important to share with our family caregivers. Now, again, one of the things I talk about a lot when we're, when we're trying to think of ways to support family caregivers is to talk to family caregivers about a journal. And in this case, we can call it a pain journal, we can call it a symptom journal, whatever it is. And, and I, I know family caregivers or people in general get, get mixed up with that term journal. I'm even thinking just a random piece of paper with, with two or three sentence on, sentences on it, documenting how things are coming, how, what's happening with the person that they're caring for. It comes in real handy and takes out a lot of the guessing work when a family caregiver has to go to a doctor with their loved one. It also, in this case, it, when, a, when the pain is lasting more than two weeks, it kind of helps chart how long the person is having that pain. So again, very important. I can't tell you, uh, uh, as a family caregiver myself, my most recent um, caregiving experience was my grandmother who ha did pass away. But at the time, um, she would say things, and uh, I should give a caveat. She, is, she was 99 when she passed away, and she did not have Alzheimer's disease, but it, Guys, you know at 99, there's some forgetfulness there. So she would say things like, I've never had this pain before. Or she'd say things, um, 
boy, I this is a new pain today. I, I've not had this pain this week or whatever. When really she kind of has either had the pain some at some point in her lifetime where she's complained about the pain, or she may have even had the pain the day before but just didn't remember that she had the pain. Now, sometimes she did, but not always. And you kind of lose track of time. So it's even where you thought you had a pain um, today. Well, I haven't had this pain in months when it could have been last week. So our... Um, family always kept a little diary, a little little notepad next to the bed of complained of this pain today, just again, so that we could stay on top of it and we could have that pertinent information so we can track changes as they occur and we can be able to tell the doctor as things occur. It's just, just again, it was so helpful for our family to kind of have that little notepad by, you know, where we could all read it and have access to it to chart her pain. So if the pain is consistent, you know, it's that two weeks or more, then families should consider an appointment with a primary care doctor is probably the best place to start. And so when physicians diagnose arthritis, they do it uh, based on several different factors. Of course, they're looking at the overall pattern of symptoms. They're obviously going to look at medical history. They're going to do a physical exam, and they're probably going to do imaging studies such as x-rays, may even do an MRI, may do a bone scan, may do some laboratory tests because there is a blood test that looks for the rheumatoid factor. This is an antibody which is present in about 70 to 80% of adults who have RA. There's also an anti-CCP. It's another blood test which has become more commonly used and is ordered if rheumatoid arthritis is suspected. And a doctor's also going to probably order um, some different tests that look at the presence of nonspecific implementation in someone's body. There's another test that doctors sometimes do um, called a C-reactive protein test or a CRP, and that may give another um, that's kind of a step up from looking at the implementation, the test that looks at all the implementation in someone's body. And sometimes, like I said previously, that an MRI might be able to give more precise information about bones and joints as well as soft tissues. So once the tests are complete and a diagnosis is confirmed, the primary care you know, physician may refer a person to a specialist. And there's quite a few different specialists that can help with arthritis, and probably the most, you know, referred to specialist is when somebody has rheumatoid arthritis, they're rheumatologists. They are arthritis specialists, and they are physicians who have had finished a residency in internal medicine and have had a fellowship in rheumatology. So the, when somebody has RA, it's a pretty serious condition, and they probably most likely see a rheumatologist. There's also a um, physiatrist, who is a physician who specialized in physical medicine and rehab. There's orthopedic surgeons. They are the people who will uh, maybe perform a surgical procedure, such as joint replacement. There's other specialists, though, that might need to be part of the treatment team. They can include a podiatrist if, if one of the areas that is affected is the person's feet, an occupational therapist is usually a great member and usually a member of the treatment team when it comes to arthritis or any type of arthritis. They really are there to help patients reach their highest level of independence in their daily activities and, and their daily tasks that they do. And then there's also physical therapists. Again, they help restore function and prevent disability for people affected by arthritis. They can prescribe some exercises that are safe for people with arthritis. And, um, you know, those, there's lots of different, different things that physical therapists can, can do. The other thing that, I, that I've often thought about or, or think that might be a good member of a treatment team would maybe even be a psychologist because they've had that specialized education and training and behavior in human psychology, and they may be able to provide some therapeutic methods and therapeutic counseling. And I think about how devastating a disease like rheumatoid arthritis would be. And I think that somebody obviously would have the potential to become depressed, 
which again, the Centers of Disease and Control and Prevention, they say that arthritis is strongly associated with major depression. So that psychologist can really help somebody, you know, get through the depression side of this disease, as well as maybe even learning some techniques to, you know, those therapeutic methods, deep breathing, meditation, some of those things that can help people get through painful, painful chronic conditions. Um, there's like major anxiety, there's emotional distress, there's could be sleep problems because somebody is upset about or depressed about having arthritis. And so anything that we can do, uh, anybody on the treatment team that can really help a person regain that ability to enjoy life again or come up with new coping strategies and improve their psychological well-being, that we've got to consider those people for as far as specialists or people that um, a family member or the person with arthritis may need to visit with on occasion, probably not on a regular basis, but some of these different specialists that we've talked about here, they, they're not constant, but they're in and out of the situation as the disease progresses or changes or as things come up and change. And of course, I would never leave out our very important social workers out there. Social workers are always a member at some point of a treatment team when there's a chronic condition. A lot of you out there are social workers and you really help those individuals handle that impact of the chronic illness. And you are the ones that are helping connect people with all of these different specialists and with the social services that might be available and any type of assistance that the family caregiver may need. A lot of times, social workers, you are all out there providing counseling and you're helping find solutions and you're looking at social and financial problems that are related to arthritis as well. So again, there's lots of different specialists that, are, that can be involved when somebody has arthritis. And so it's just important to kind of, you know, understand those different professionals. So as you help a family with arthritis, with somebody with arthritis, then you can kind of think about these different professionals that might be helpful. Okay, let's talk about treatments for arthritis on the next slide. There's some, obviously, some very common treatments, and so we're going to cover those. Uh, pain being the most common symptom of almost all forms of arthritis, so easing pain is the primary goal of medical treatment bottom line. So the most common first line of defense are those over-the-counter aspirin or the non-anti-inflammatory drugs, and they, they have a grouping and they're called NSAIDs. So those are the disease, those are the names of the drugs, I mean. And those different drugs, they're non-steroidal, they, they have, um, they help with immediate pain relief, they have anti-inflammatory effects, and they're relatively safe, although like any drug, they can have different side effects, they can affect people in different ways, they can interact with other medications. And so any kind of medication, um, even these types of non-prescription drugs should be discussed with a physician or a pharmacist always. Now, because of the prevalence of arthritis, many prescription drugs have also been developed. Biologics are the most recent breakthrough for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, biologics are genetically engineered proteins derived from human genes, and they're designed to inhibit specific components of the immune system that play that pivotal role in fueling, fueling inflammation, which is a central feature of rheumatoid arthritis, as we know. These biologics are administered by injection, and these drugs have been found to dramatically improve the quality of life for people suffering with RA. So that is the great news. And I think we've all seen some of those commercials for these new drugs out there for RA. But um, it's a great, it's a good breakthrough for people that are suffering from that form of arthritis. Now the corticosteroids, those are a class of drugs that include steroids and they're designed to suppress the immune system and the symptoms of implement, implementation these are often injected into the painful osteoarthritic joints, and they're used to treat the autoimmune forms of arthritis. Again, we're talking about RA here. However, there's very serious potential side effects, 
and people should avoid taking steroids for long periods of time or even in the high dose, but that's, again, one of those conversations for the doctor and the pharmacist or the rheumatologist, whoever they're seeing, the specialist. Other treatments include the use of hot or cold, um, heat or cold over joints or muscles. It may give people some short-term relief from pain and stiffness. That's where our physical therapists can be very helpful in determining the regimen of hot and cold packs. There's also alternative therapies, such as acupuncture, meditation, uh, aromatherapy actually has uh, some effects on people with arthritis. Magnets, you've, we've all seen those commercials about the different magnets. Um, herbal remedies, and then there's lots of supplements that may offer results in conjunction with traditional therapies. Again, it's important to plan um, and it's important for families to talk and consult with physicians before trying any of these alternative therapies. Again, just making sure, especially a supplement or herbal remedy or, or one of those, making sure that doesn't interact with anything else in any part of the treatment plan. There's actually some surgical options as well. There's uh, one option is to inject the arthritic joints with a man-made version of joint fluid, which can help relieve pain. That, that procedure sounds painful, but again, the outcome would be to prevent pain relieve some of the pain. Another option may be even be surgery to rebuild or replace a joint that is affected by arthritis. Both of these treatments can greatly improve the quality of life for an arthritic patient. So again, if it's severe enough, there are surgical options available. Now, many people suffering from arthritis find that lifestyle changes can also greatly improve symptoms from osteoarthritis and other long-term types of arthritis. So I want to talk about those lifestyle changes and discuss tips of preventing as well as discuss tips for living with arthritis on the next slide. This is always my favorite part of these webinars is when we get to talk about the lifestyle changes that we need to make to live with these chronic conditions. And I'm sure as you, as you all know or, and as you've been on these webinars, when we talk about these chronic conditions, the lifestyle changes are all very similar. So the great news is, is if, you, if we can convince our family caregivers or we convince the people with arthritis to implement some of these lifestyle changes, it's going to impact several different avenues of, our, of aging, so that's the great news. But there really are a number of things that people can do to improve their quality of life if they already have arthritis, or they can think about prevention of arthritis. Now, according to the Arthritis Foundation, it's going to be no surprise to all of you, but one of the best ways for us to protect our joints is to maintain an ideal body weight. The more someone weighs, the more stress that puts on our hips, knees, back, and feet. I know. You're all shaking your head. We know, Molly. That's common sense. And you're exactly right. It is complete common sense. However, when we are talking to our families or we're talking to the seniors or we're talking to each other right now, it's just something to think about. You all know how painful arthritis can be. And if we can give another reason why people should um, maintain a healthy weight, this is just one of those um, additions to the list of, of positive reasons. I feel like a lot of times we are um, almost like personal trainers, all of us out there trying to talk to families, and we have to keep repeating the same messages over and over and over again. So this is just another type of a message, and hopefully one of the times it it gets through to the person and they make changes. Think about those personal trainers out there, how they're constantly, you know, giving people exercises and either they do it or they don't, but they never give up. They keep doing it. So that's kind of, I kind of think about it that way sometimes. And that leads me right into, of course, another important part of living with arthritis and preventing arthritis is a regular exercise program. We know the research shows that even a limited amount of exercise can prevent some of the negative effects of arthritis by strengthening muscles that support that painful or damaged joint. Strong muscles also keep the joints from rubbing against one another, wearing down the cartilage. Exercise can also build stronger bones. Exercise protects joints by strengthening the muscles around them. 
It improves the balance as well as it promotes sleep and it promotes a sense of well-being. I know uh, for me, when I exercise, I sleep way better than when I don't exercise. So again, when we think about somebody with arthritis and chronic pain, sleeping is very important. And so getting a little exercise can help with that sleep pattern. Regular exercise can also reduce the risk of heart disease, which can be a problem for people with certain forms of arthritis. And so when you think about what a good workout should include, it should have um, activities that, that, that promote flexibility, aerobic activities, and strengthening activities. And of course, this is where we always need to remember to consult with a doctor, or this is where that physical therapist comes in real handy, or any other specially trained health professional that can develop an individualized exercise routine. Now, there are some things a person with arthritis should avoid, and those are things like running, jumping, or jarring of the joints. So the great news is I don't think we have a lot of seniors running, although there are. There are seniors who run marathons. We've, all, we've seen those those feel good stories as well, but um, we just need to think about no jumping and jarring joints, so avoiding activities like that. So walking probably is the most popular form of exercise that almost anyone arth with arthritis could do. There's also swimming is a big one, aquatic exercises. A lot of people in, the, in swimming classes that have arthritis are trying to ease the, the pain of arthritis as well. There's also those stationary bikes. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of you are familiar with the uh, stationary bike called the New Step. It's a, it's a recumbent bike that you sit on, but you can also move your arms. I've seen it in a lot of senior wellness type facilities. It's a, it's, I've seen a lot of PT rooms as well in, in hospitals and, and skilled care. So very popular machine that's excellent for people with arthritis. And then, you know, everyday tasks. We've got to think about gardening, um, some even dancing. If, if somebody's a ballroom dancer, those are great activities to continue to do um, to, to relieve some of those symptoms and really help strengthen the joints and the muscles. Another lifestyle changes that I have to, uh, you know, say here is quitting smoking. It's um, Smoking has been found to increase the incidence of rheumatoid arthritis. So quitting smoking is another lifestyle change to consider as well. Okay, on the next slide, let's talk about the impact of nutrition on arthritis, which I find absolutely fascinating. I hope you do too. There are a number of things that family caregivers can encourage their loved one to do to improve their quality of life, and eating right is a big factor. This means adding more of those veggies, the fruits, nuts, tea, and even some chocolate into our diet. Uh, many foods can affect a person's arthritic symptoms. Some foods may help fight inflammation, while others may trigger those symptoms or arthritic flares. So, so some of the foods that fight inflammation are those, again, fruits and veggies, the whole grains, our fish, newts, nuts and seeds, olive oil, beans, and fiber. And then there are foods that we should avoid when a person has arthritis. So these are this is a very important information to share with our families. And those are those saturated fats, the trans fats, salt or sodium, sugars, alcohol, dairy products. All of those can lead to implementation or trigger some flare-ups. And it's interesting, a lot of people with arthritis know some of their flare-up foods. This is another great area to think about that journal, if a family is keeping a journal or the person with arthritis to keep a journal of, oh, I had a major flare-up, what did I eat the last few days? And they can kind of pinpoint what those areas are. Um, those omega-3 fatty acids in the fish and the salmon and the tuna, they can really help reduce that joint implementation. So more fish and less red meat. Also vitamin C and other antioxidants are there to help reduce the risk of osteoarthritis. Oranges and citrus fruits are good sources of folic acid, which can help alleviate some of the side effects. So there's, there's lots of different um, things that families can do when it comes to an, even just the diet that can really make a big impact. Let's look on the next slide about some additional resources outside of nutrition that can really help our family caregivers as well. 
I think the first thing when we talk to families is to really remind them that the person with arthritis should try to maintain their daily activities and routines as much as possible. So bathing and dressing, cleaning, cooking, traveling, all of those things, join friends, social activities, keep up those those daily activities as much as possible. But at some point, the person may need some help. And so there's just a few little tips I want to share with you here before we get to the questions uh, that a family can use to help somebody live with arthritis a little bit easier. And that is, the first one maybe would be using tape or foam curlers to build up handles of toothbrushes, hairbrushes, and, and spoons and forks like you see on the slide there. They make those foam handles for people with arthritis, but you can also just use some tape. It doesn't have to be a fancy tool. Um, placing a towel on the edge of the bathtub for a person to sit on and then have them swivel on the towel to get in and out of the tub. Another one of those really good tips for family caregivers. Here's another good one. Families should encourage their loved one to put on uh, maybe a absorbent terry cloth robe after showering and relax a few minutes instead of toweling off. It just might be easier. Think about automatic soap and shampoo dispensers instead of that slippery bar of soap. You know, thinking of somebody with, with um, fingers that may not bend as, as well or be painful to bend. Now, this is a pretty ambitious one, but removing the buttons from shirts and sewing over the buttonholes and adding Velcro as fasteners to replace the buttons. Again, it's ambitious. I'm not a, a person who sews, so, but I think there's a lot of family caregivers out there that do, and they're looking for any tips to help make their loved one's life easier. So that's another great tip. And then um, they do make lots of products. The Arthritis Foundation, there's a full brochure on their webpage that we'll look at in just a second. They have lots of products from Ziploc bags to special food covers that are easy to pull on and off. There's special upright vacuums, all kinds of stuff that, that we can do that, that families can look at and consider. And the other thing families need to maybe think about are those assistive devices. Of course, that would be, at, you know, the last resort, so to speak, but because um, we want to keep keep people as independent as possible, but things like that automatic chair lift or a, um, even plates with curved sides that can help people trap food easily onto utensils, a raised toilet seat, extended reachers. You know, we've seen those all at, at Walgreens or whatever store, those grip, those reachers that can help grab things. So there's some assistive devices that can be helpful for families as well. All right. On our final slide, or almost our final slide, let's go to the next slide and talk about some of those resources that we like to talk about uh, on every webinar here. Now, caring for a senior loved one who is suffering from arthritis, like I mentioned, can be very tough, especially depending on the level of pain and the level of disability, and it can carry a lot of difficult decisions. Uh, for families, and so when we think about these resources, the Arthritis Foundation is a great one. They have a 24-hour 800 number. They have a wonderful website. They have a great consumer magazine. And so when our caregivers, they can sometimes feel overwhelmed and trapped and isolated and just, you know, like, what do I do now kind of a feeling. Uh, the Arthritis Foundation and their website is a great great sites. They have lots of different things about um, how to manage medications, how to cope with pain, you know, how transportation issues, making the home safe, all those types of things are covered on that website that can really help our family caregivers. Um, and then another, another, you know, resource to consider would be that caregivers should really be encouraged to learn all they can about pain management. They are the advocate for their senior loved one. We've talked about the log or a journal keeping a pain log, but really understanding pain management, caregivers need to immerse themselves in understanding that so they can really help their senior loved one. And then uh, caregivers really need to make sure that they take care of themselves. It's so difficult, as I mentioned, to watch someone you love suffer from a painful condition that never ends. 
And so we really need to encourage our caregivers to get that rest and that support that they need. So caregiverstress.com is another great website that can help families really learn from each other families, learn great tips, learn how to manage stress, all of those different things that our family caregivers need. All right, on the final slide, let's think about some next steps uh, that you can all take back with you, and I want you to think about a few of these things. I want you to think about um, a lot of the information we've gone over today. It's, it's been a lot. I hope you found it helpful, and I hope you found it encouraging. But I want you to consider, you know, think about the resources that you need to understand better so that you can help um, families that are family caregivers and people that are suffering from arthritis. Is there anything you've learned today that you need to add to your, quote, uh, arsenal of tool, your tool chest that I always talk about? You guys have all these toolkits handy. Are there any additional resources you need to add to your list? Are there any, um, are there any issues that you've thought about today that you can discuss with people, with your clients or with your family members or with your seniors that you are helping that you can offer from this webinar? And then how are you going to use this information in the future? So I just want you to think about those things. And again, I want to thank you all so much for your time today and for listening in. I'm going to turn it back over to Steve and open the phone lines up for questions. All right, fantastic presentation, Molly. Lots of good information, as you said. Um, speaking of which, everyone, if you want the information that is contained on these slides, don't feel that you have to furiously write it down. Just uh, download the slides, and all of the resources, the phone numbers, et cetera, will be on there. So um, don't feel that you have to take the notes. Just download the slides, and you will get all that information right there. It is time for the Q&A session, so uh, let's get to it here, Molly. Um, can you talk about a possibility of a gluten-free diet being better um, for arth arthritis sufferers? You know what? I did read a couple of articles about that, and I've read about um, the paleo diet or the diet where you eat, um, well, you eat clean. It's very similar to the gluten-free diet, I guess, if, if, I, if I understand both diets Fair, you know, from a high level. Um, I have read that. And, I, and when I was reading more about arthritis and preparing for this webinar, I, I saw that article several, several times. I do, I do think that's something to consider. I think it's relatively new, and I think the studies that are out there on this are new. Um, you know, a lot of times when, when research is done, it takes a few years to really understand the impact that some of these different, like the paleo diet or the gluten-free diet can have on arthritis. And so again, it's pretty new. I think it's definitely something to talk to doctors about. I think it's definitely something to consider because we talked about the importance of how the different foods can impact. And so I know it's a huge lifestyle change, so you hate to tell somebody, why don't you just try it for a week? But Maybe you try it slowly for a week or you try a few things, um, a few of the main tips off either of those diets, uh, you know, a few of the concepts, I guess I'm trying to say. And so like on the paleo diet, for example, it might be eating cleanly so you're not going to eat a lot of processed food this week and see if that has an impact on how the person feels. I obviously would encourage um, – I think that is very resourceful, and I think it's definitely something to bring up when you are consulting and talking with family caregivers and people with arthritis, but the caveat always is to double check and with the doctor or a physician or, or the nurse practitioner in the office just when you make these big food and lifestyle changes that it's not going to impact any other chronic conditions or medications that the person is on, but I did read that, and I I read those articles. I found them fascinating. So I think that's a great idea, great tip, and a great resource, very resourceful. Okay, uh, next question here for you, Molly. What are the signs or symptoms that arthritis is too much for a person living alone, and when would you seek outside help for a situation like this? Well, um, I think the signs and symptoms probably vary from person to person, but I think that um, 
I hate to say that it's obvious because I don't, I don't, I think that's the wrong word, but when somebody is in chronic pain on a regular basis, clearly that is a sign for a need for outside help. And, and if pain isn't managed properly, then I think what comes with that is, you know, a messier house or uh, maybe the person's not as maybe a little disheveled or not as put together. Maybe they're avoiding social situations. Um, maybe their mood has completely changed or, or, or worse or, or they seem uh, very down. So I think that um, it's probably a little bit different for every person. And I think um, when families ask that question or when, when people ask me that question, I always sort of turn it back to the family and say, if you feel uncomfortable about it, if you've noticed a change and you're concerned, then it's time to at least make a phone call or, you know, call the doctor and ask more questions or look for some additional resources or call the social worker that helps you discharge from a hospital or whoever, you know, try to get a little bit more information. So I don't, I don't, again, it's so, I know this is one of those really hard things. Families ask all of us all the time, when do I need to, you know, change something in my loved one's life? When do I need to add something or move them or bring in a caregiver, we get that question all of the time. And it, it really goes back to the family caregiver and how they're feeling inside with the situation. And I think if somebody is actually asking that question, it might be uh, an indication that it could, they're reaching out saying it might be time for more help or need more assistance or, and I think, you know, when you, when whoever just asked that question said, um, you know, when's it time for more help or more resources? That doesn't mean they're going to move away from home or move out of the house or need to go to assisted living or whatever it is. It's just, yes, time for more help. So I guess I, I would say it's all up, it's, it's pretty individualized. And I think if you're having the concern and you've had the concern for a week or a few weeks or whatever it is, it's time to get more help or time to reach out for some additional resources. Okay, uh, can you talk about for a minute here why alcohol in moderation, of course, is a poor diet choice and what is the effect on this condition? You know, um, I think with alcohol, that's, I think it sort of depends on the person. That's my impression, what I've witnessed in the, um, in my experience. Um, so like when I used to work at, um, a facility, a, a senior living community, if you will, it was interesting because we did have a couple of people who had arthritis and I, I and I, it's funny, I haven't thought of this till now, but basically one of the ladies, she would have a little glass of wine and she would say, um, I'm just having one little glass, a couple drinks, because otherwise my arthritis will flare up. So I think our, I think the thing with alcohol is is that it's one of those one of those situations where it could be a flare up for you or it could not be a flare up for you. I think I think it's a little bit um, it depends. And I also know that it it's really related to rheumatoid arthritis. It's a little bit more serious when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis. So I think that when people have that form of arthritis, alcohol, and I, 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 will, tell, I will be honest with you, I can't really um, pinpoint, I, I, I guess I don't know the medical reason why alcohol impacts it, but I, I, I've read several cases that it does. You know, and I've learned this over the years because when you work in those type of settings and you're having, you know, when people can have wine at dinner, you learn what everybody's conditions are. So you learn, I, I learned after a while, I don't really offer this person alcohol because they, or, you know, their glass of wine because they have arthritis and it would be, it would hurt them if they, if they have the arthritis. So it's just one of those, I can't explain medically why alcohol is bad for somebody, especially with rheumatoid arthritis, but it just is one of those, I, I'm going to look it up though now. I'm very curious. So I'm going to, I'm going to read up on that. I apologize that I don't know really the medical reason why I would imagine it has something to do with causing extra inflammation, implementation, but I don't, I don't really know off the top of my head. I apologize. All right, Molly. Well, we have hit the end of our hour here, and we are just about out of time today, but we want to thank you for joining us today and for another fantastic webinar. Thanks for being here.
Thank you, and thanks all of you. Have a great day.